Okay. In 2002, I had the great honor of sharing the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Sidney Brenner and John Selston. Now, people have sometimes asked me, did I know that I was going to receive a Nobel Prize? The answer is easy, no. I, I didn't know, I couldn't know. And in fact, it's clear, it was clear to me then, it's clear to me now, that there are many scientists who have made major pioneering contributions in the field of biomedicine who are at least as deserving as I was for the Nobel Prize. Nonetheless, for some years I had been acutely aware of the first Monday in October, uh, the day in which the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine is announced. And starting, I think it was in about 1995, uh, I knew when each announcement day was approaching. Uh, I had probably progressively more trouble sleeping the night before. The announcement is made at 11.30 in the morning in Stockholm, which is 5.30 in the morning in Boston. And I invariably got up early um, knowing that the phone had not rung to look and see who, in fact, were the recipients for that particular year. There were a number of years where various people, quote, in the know, told me, ah, this is going to be your year. Uh, they were, of course, wrong. In addition, the MIT News Office uh, liked to keep tabs on me for that date. And for a number of years, they contacted me prior to that first Monday in October, asking me where I would be uh, on that date, just in case. Okay? Uh, something that was not totally calming, uh, I would say. However, in 2002, they didn't contact me. In this first year in some years, they hadn't contacted me. And I had the belief, well, OK, maybe the time has come and gone, and uh, it's, this just isn't going to happen. Now, where I was on that day was in Europe, in fact, in France. Uh, I, I, my daughter in 2002 was nine years old, and she had had a series of au pairs. And one of her au pairs, somebody our family had become very close to, was getting married in the French Alps. And my daughter, my wife, and I went to the French Alps for the weekend uh, to celebrate in that marriage ceremony. Now, of course, when the New York Times reported all of this, what they said was that I was off with my family on holiday in the French Alps, slightly different from a quick trip over the weekend to go to a wedding. But you know, it was pretty close, so it's not, not, not so bad. Now, we spent the Saturday basically at the wedding. We spent the Sunday at a brunch and other events with the family. And we stayed on one extra day, the Monday, so that we would have time with the uh, newlywed bride and groom. And we had gone out on that Monday morning and came back to the house of, of the au pair, Christelle, uh, of, of her parents' house. And when we walked in, her father said to me that I had gotten a phone call. Now, he, he doesn't speak English, so there was some ambiguity, at least to me, in exactly what he was saying. And I heard him say that I'd gotten a phone call from Boston. Now, we had only been gone for the weekend. The only thing that I could imagine might be leading to a phone call from Boston was that maybe the lab burned down. And uh, I was a little apprehensive when he, he gave that message. And he said that he had written down a, a phone number so that I could return the call. The problem was his not speaking English meant that his phone number wasn't in numbers, but was rather written out in letters with the sounds that he heard, um, with, a, I would say, a bit of a French uh, accent to, to these letters. So I got what was the number and looked at it. And uh, two things were apparent. First, he said again that I got a phone call from, but this time when he said it, 
um, it was clearly Stockholm that he said, not Boston. And uh, that gave me an uh, aha, that, that's interesting. Uh, and the second was looking at the number, although the letters uh, were not totally clear. It, it clearly wasn't a Boston number. So this, this was not Boston. And Stockholm on that day uh, caught my attention. Now having said that, uh, there, there were some caveats. So that, for example, I had heard a story some years ago, and I'm not sure uh, that, that the source was the, the person I'm thinking of, but I think it was from Gunther Blobel. Uh, at Rockefeller, who, who did receive a Nobel Prize for, for his breakthrough work. And uh, I had heard a story, I think from Gunther, that some years before he received the prize, he, he was awakened uh, at 5.30 in the morning, uh, New York time in his case, uh, by someone with a Swedish accent telling him something that turned out to be a joke from a friend of his with a, quote, sense of humor. So I began to think about my own friends uh, and their senses of humor, and I, I could imagine that something comparable was not out of the question. So I wasn't really confident what this meant. But what we did, first I tried calling the number, and it did get to Sweden, but it got to a number not in service, so that didn't help. And then we went and we listened to the radio and watched television until about 20 minutes later, uh, there was an announcement uh, which basically had three names, Sidney Brenner, John Sulston, and me. So at that point, I knew it was real. And at that point, my, my life was about to change really forever. So what did I do? Well, the first thing I did was call my mother. Uh, my mother was in Chicago. It was very early in Chicago. Her immediate response was, what's wrong? Uh, but I quickly told her, and uh, she was, I would say, well, what can I say? What better thing can you do to call your mother and say, uh, I've won a Nobel Prize, uh, other than perhaps saying you are a grandmother, which I think still is her, her greatest thrill. Um, eventually, uh, after I hung up for my mother, uh, there was a message on the phone in France, and I guess, I guess they had tried to call while I was on the phone. And uh, this time, uh, I could hear the voice, and I got a phone number, and I called back, and I reached Hans Jornval, uh, who at that point was the secretary of the Nobel Committee of the Nobel Assembly of the Karolinska Institute, and it was Hans's privilege to contact the new recipients and tell them the news. Now Hans was a bit depressed, and the reason he was depressed is he was 0 for 3 uh, that year. He failed to reach Sydney, John, or me. Sydney was on an airplane flying from Singapore to Germany. John was in his lab working and got the news from a recorded message, and I was out. So this, this was a year in which Hans felt that he had missed his annual joy, and in fact, he began the conversation by saying, well, by now, I imagine that you know, um, would you have some time to talk with me? And I said to him, uh, yes, Hans, I'd be delighted to talk with you. Um, let me mention one other immediate consequence of the events of that morning. Um, the question is, how did Hans get the phone number in France? And the answer was, he called my house uh, outside of Boston and there he reached my daughter's current au pair, um, who was from Ecuador. And he called her, he said he was trying to reach me, she gave the number, that was fine. But then, when the announcement was made, um, reporters started calling my house. And of course I wasn't there, and the au pair answered, and answered, and answered, over and over again, uh, this uh, deluge of, of phone calls. Um, this made her nervous because it turned out she grew up with a wealthy family in Ecuador and in the area where she lived uh, what happened if somebody wanted to rob one of the wealthy houses they would telephone there and they would see how many people answered 
the phone. How many distinct people answered after a series of calls? And if there were a lot of people home, well, they said this isn't the time. But if nobody answered or only one person answered, then they would go to the house, break in, rob the house, and in some cases do far worse. So she became uh, rather scared from this uh, set of phone calls. And of course, about 30 minutes later, when the press couldn't reach anybody on the phone or at least get any answers from, from what she was saying, they came to the door and started ringing the doorbell and banging on the door. And she panicked and went under the bed and apparently hid under the bed for about three hours before everybody left and she finally emerged. Uh, at that point, she came out and she did what I told her to do if there was any emergency, which was call my mother in Chicago. She called my mother. My mother explained what was going on and uh, then things calmed down. The next day was Tuesday. That was the day we were scheduled to go home. Uh, and the day we did go home, we, we drove from where we were in France to Geneva, flew from there to Frankfurt, and then back to Boston. And uh, at both airports in Geneva and, and uh, Frankfurt, there were large numbers of international newspapers. And my picture was in almost all of them from all over the world. And my wife, looking at this, said, hey, you know, maybe, um, maybe you can show this to, to the agent at, at the desk. And maybe because this is such a special day, they'll give us an upgrade from coach class economy. And I said, well, OK, we'll, we'll give it a go. So my daughter opened up some of the newspapers. I took about half a dozen different newspapers, opened to a page with my picture went to the desk, talked to the agent, explained the situation, and said, you know, is there any chance you could give, because of this great celebratory day for us, um, any chance you could, you could give us an upgrade? The agent thought about it, and she said, OK, I'm going to upgrade all three of you to business class. And I was delighted. And my daughter was standing next to me, age nine, coming up to about here. And she looks at the agent and says, only business class? And the agent looks back at her and says, next time. Okay. So we flew back business class, very pleasant, and then uh, resumed what from there on out was uh, not quite a normal life. Thank you.